morning I get the privilege of preaching to the choir because um, if you were here last week and you came back, I know you're in it, right? It's like uh, one of the, the, the Lord has a, has a funny way of uh, when we preach through books and stuff, when we reach a, a, high, a, a high attendance Sunday, it's uh, Ananias and Sapphira, boom, you know, and uh, but um, uh, we are learning. I hope that the book of Acts is a blessing to you. And as we read through this and see what God's doing, uh, that we will understand that we are a part of this greatest movement that's ever entered into world history called the church. And we get to be a part of that. So let's, let, let's, let's read. We're going to read back in Acts chapter 4. We're going to read verses 29 through 31. And this is the prayer. Now, we're going to preach the book in Acts 5, but we're going to read the prayer that after the apostles were arrested and they were told not to preach in the name of Jesus, and they said, we got to obey God rather than man, they went back and they went to, uh, they came together, and they came together with, with the believers, and they prayed. And this is what they prayed. Acts 4.29, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come together as your people and worship you, Lord, learn from you and celebrate all that you have done and uh, we'll do in our lives, God. And I pray that you'd give us ears to hear today. Help us to hear what you want us to, ha- to hear through your word. I pray that you'd give me clarity. Help me to preach um, plain and clear, Father. I understand the judgment on my life and rightly dividing your word of truth. And I do accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I do pray. Amen. <clears throat> the title this morning is this thought right here. A new way to live. A new way to live. Look at your neighbor and say, a new way to live. Jesus has called his church into a new way to live. Uh, the Holy Spirit's moving among them. They're preaching, they're teaching, and, and God is, is doing a work. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 12, we're going to see evidence of two things. One, we're going to see an evidence of Jesus fulfilling what he told the apostles would happen. He told them and commissioned them and said, you are going to preach and you're going to be my witnesses and the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be upon you. We read in the Gospels, he gave the apostles the authority to heal, to cast out demons and, and, and to preach. And then we see in Acts 4.29, when the church got together, they prayed uh, that, that God would move and that signs and wonders would take place and God's healing miracles would happen so that they would continue to preach the word of God in boldness. And when we read through the book of Acts, every time that we see miraculous signs and wonders and healings and miracles, it is all to help aid the power and the preaching of the word of God. That these miracles are pointing people to the the gospel truth of who Jesus is. And so in Acts chapter 5, verse 12, we pick up and it says, Now many signs and wonders were being done through the, uh, the people... Among the people, they, by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. And the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Uh, This really takes you back to the life of Jesus when Jesus would uh, go into towns. And there would be moments when people, they would flock to him, right? And and this one in particular lady that had heard that that, that Jesus was coming and, and she'd been sick. Uh, for many years of, throughout her life, and she thought, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I might be healed. And we see the, that the Holy Spirit's moving among the apostles, and there's great signs and wonders, and people are coming together, mass crowds. Thousands of people are coming to faith to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord, and there's gathering once again. There's a huge gathering of people coming to hear 
Peter and the apostles to see what's going on, to receive healing, and they're hearing the teaching, God's word, and, and, and the, the religious elites look and see, and, and they don't like it. They don't like what's going on. Verse 17. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with what? Jealousy. Or some of your translations say indignation. And filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. Filled with jealousy. What are they jealous about? Well, their power is being threatened. Their system with Rome is being threatened. Their, their whole religious belief is being challenged. And jealousy is a powerful motivator to attack, is it not? If you're jealous, if you're filled with jealousy, you can't stand to see someone or, or, or some, something be successful or more successful than you, right? And so what's happening is that there's all kinds of people coming to listen to the apostles. They're hearing this teaching. People are being healed. They're starting to abandon the Jewish faith and start following this new, what they would call sect. And, and, and the people are starting to listen and pay more attention to Peter and the apostles than they are them. And that's not good for them, right? They don't like that. They're starting to lose some power. So the best thing that they can do is to shut them up. And so they, they get them, they arrest them. This is the second time that they have arrested them. Remember, they already told them once to stop preaching in his name. And they put them in prison. But verse 19, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. So they get arrested. An angel shows up, unlocks the door, and says, Hey, you all go flee and run. This is your time to escape. Right? Is that what he said? No. He said, All right, I'm going to open these doors up. You're going to go back to the temple. And you're going to go and you're going to proclaim this life, this life. You're going to teach the people about a new way to live. That there is a new way to live that no longer do we follow what we were taught. Now we realize that Jesus, in fact, he, was, he is the Messiah. He came to deliver us and now we worship a risen Lord. There's going to be a new way to live. Tell them about this life, this life, the Christian life, the way of faith, the way of belief, the way of forgiveness, the way of mercy, the way of grace. In Jesus there is life, right? John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning, and all things were made through him, and there was nothing that was made that was not made by him. And in him was the light of, of life, and he was the life to all men. And he appeared, but the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. He was not the light, but he was one to testify to the one who is the light. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Everyone who believes in him, he gave the right to be called children of God, who were born not of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In 1 John 5, he tells us, that God grants us life, and in Jesus is where we have life. Go tell the people about this life. This life, what life? The Christian life, the Jesus life. The new way to live is following in obedience and walking with the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the life to, li to live, amen? Not, not this life as we know it. Not just in this, this world system. But in God's system, you hear me say it, I say this often, I, I quote Proverbs, this proverb a lot because it's true. There is a way that seems right unto man, 
but the end leads to death, right? There's our way of living, and then there's God's way of living. And when we live his life, when we make his life our life, and we live our life his way, it's a better way. It's not the easy way. It's not always a way that doesn't have any type of pain or suffering, but it is the way that leads to life. Some of you have lived your way a long time. And you tried it. You did it how you thought you should do it. And you didn't do it the way God said to do it. And uh, some of you even did this. You knew. You knew. You said, I know I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it. And you walked in the path of your ways. And how, how does that work? It ends to death. But there is a way that leads to life. And that life is found in Jesus. Go tell people, go preach, go teach, go share them about this life. This life of forgiveness and mercy and grace that Jesus, the Son of God, came to take away the sin of the world. Share with them. Tell them about this life. And that's what they go do. They go into the temple and they start preaching this life. Now, when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate and the people of Israel and sent the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the door, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them. There was some guy that was out there at the temple, heard them, came running and told him, said, said, the men you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So they come back and they say, that guy you locked up that you all can't find, I know where, he's, I know, I know where they are. They're out, there, they're out there teaching, preaching the same place that you all took them from. They're back at it again. You better go get them. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. A lot of people were listening to what Peter and them had to say, so uh, they had to be uh, sensitive how they, they got them back because they didn't want the people to turn on them. Now notice what happens. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, we stri- did we not tell you? We told you, stop teaching and preaching in this man's name. We've told you once. This is the second time we're telling you, stop it. And I have to ask this question again. What is it about the name of Jesus that gets people so in an uproar? Huh? What is it? What is it about Jesus? You know, because if you you can pray in the name of God, you can pray a generic prayer to God, right? God bless this. You know, and if I'm in a if I'm in a group of people that have different types of belief systems and different religions. Every religion then can hear the word God and then they go ahead and identify their own God to that term God. You with me? So if I just pray to God, that can be a safe prayer. Because people can interpret that however they want to. It can be the God of their own understanding. But when I name the name Jesus... Now I am clearly defining who my God is. And our culture does not like that, does it? Now, when Peter and and John and the apostles were preaching this, they didn't like it because the name of Jesus was upsetting their power and influence. The reason why I believe that our culture doesn't like to hear the name of Jesus is because the God of America really is the God of self. 
We love ourselves so much and we love the, our autonomy that we are independent of anyone and anything. We love the idea of our own personal freedom and our free will and our independence that there is no one Nobody, no person, no institution, no church, no nothing that's going to tell me what to do. Kind of like when John the Baptist came preaching. Remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist came, he's a wild man, preaching. Repent, the kingdom of God's at hand. Old King Herod went by. What'd he do? He calls out old King Herod. Repent! He was sleeping with his sister-in-law. And he called him out and said, that, that, that's, that's abomination, that's sin. We hate to be called out. How dare anyone say that we're sinners? We don't want to hear that. That puts us in a bad place. We start getting nervous. We start looking for a safe space. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. Don't tell me that I need a Savior. You can't tell me that I've sinned. Who are you to tell me that I have sinned? What, the Bible says that we're sinners. Well, what's the Bible? What's the Bible have the right to tell me that I need to repent? We do not want to submit to authority. We don't want to believe that we're wrong. Why? Because we've raised a generation telling them how great they are. We gave them all participation trophies. And said, everybody's so good. You're so wonderful. And we stop parenting. We don't want to spank our... We, don't want, we, we, we got real educated in the, in the 80s and 90s. And I think it started maybe in the 70s. And with this new psychology and understanding of uh, parenting. You don't ever want to spank your child. No, it might hurt their... It might hurt them. No, you know, you need to... Um, you just put them in time out. One... Two. Now I'm about to get to three. Don't let me get to three. One. I tell you, I, I see parents do that. I, I want to take over. I just want to take over. I want to take over. Why? Because when they're a young age, you know what? They're doing something they're not supposed to do. Stop it. That's, you, you don't do that. You don't do that. They need to realize there is a consequence for their poor choices, that every poor choice has a bad consequence, and that, that you need to teach them to understand, to submit to the authority, and that they need to know right from wrong, that they're not always perfect and they're not always right. And so we have this whole culture now where we think everybody, but we're, we're just never wrong. And if you say something that disturbs me, I might have an emotional breakdown. <laughs> and we have, we have universities that, that can't allow a, a Christian to come and speak. Why? <gasps> because they may say something that I disagree with, and I just I can't handle it. That's hate speech. And I don't know, oh, gosh, what are we going to do? And we don't like to be told the way that you're thinking is wrong. The way that you're living is wrong. The way that you're doing life is not appropriate or it's not God honoring. You must submit to the Lord God Almighty. There is a God and maker and creator of all things. And there is a judgment one day and everyone will be held accountable. And we will give an account unto God. And you will give an account for every word you've spoken, every thought that you've had, and, and you will stand in judgment. And we do not like to hear that message. That I am a sinner that needs to repent of my sin and place my faith and trust in Jesus. They tell us, in the church world, if you want your church to grow, you cannot tell people they're sinners. I'm glad we've never been worried about church growth here. Because Jesus is not interested in a crowd. 
he's interested in a congregation that is living his life, not our own life. It's a new way to live. And Jesus calls us to a new way to live. And in our culture today, if you stand up for the name of Jesus, you may be ridiculed or mocked. It's okay. It's okay. Do not preach in this name. And then they say, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching. Man, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be great? I mean, what a, that was a compliment. You know, they were like, you're, trying, you're corrupting this whole, this, this, this whole Jerusalem has been corrupted by your teaching. And Peter and John are like going, no, we've been, we're saving people in this, in this city. Wouldn't it be a wonderful if it would be said that Living Water Church and the believers in this county, that, that we lived our lives in such a way that we filled the whole county with the teaching of Jesus. That the whole surrounding counties with the teaching of Jesus. That, that the Christians in the state of Kentucky was so living their faith out that they filled the whole state of Kentucky with the teaching of Jesus. That the whole nation, the whole United States of America is flooded with true believers living out their faith in Christ. They tell him, they say, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. It's that never going to stop attitude that we see once again. We've got to obey God rather than man. Now, any time that our government or any institution or any boss or anyone, even your parent, if they are telling you to do something that is contrary to the word of God, that goes against the Lord, you're obligated to obey God over man. Now, if, if you work, if you have a, have a boss and, 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 and your parents or whatever situation that you have somebody over authority over you and they're not asking you to do anything that's unbiblical, they're not asking you to compromise what the Bible says, you're going to obey them. But when it comes to the point of you're asking me to disobey God, I cannot do that. I have to obey God rather than man. And they preach and what they say, the God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior or prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. What do they do? They use that as another opportunity to preach the gospel. They say, no. You handed over the leader, the prince of life, the author of life. He said that back in Acts 3. You handed him over to be killed, but God raised him from the grave so that repentance and forgiveness might be offered to you. The amazing invitation of God's grace that every single one of us here in this church building today if we have not received mercy and forgiveness, he makes it available to us today. That he died so that your sins might be forgiven. That you may be made right before a holy God. That you don't have to pay for your sin. That you can plead the blood of Jesus and call upon his name and receive mercy and forgiveness. And today, if you have never placed your faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, today would be the day to say, Lord, I believe you're the prince, you're the Savior, you're the leader unto salvation. It's your way and I want to know you today. Because he is the prince of peace, and the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. And the government will be upon his shoulders and to his kingdom there will be no end. So he gives the message. They have to discuss what they're going to do because they are so mad. They want to kill them. Look at that. When they heard this, they were enraged and they wanted to kill them. Not every time that the gospel is presented will people respond with applause. True? If you make a stand for your faith, if you're in college, you make a stand for your faith, there will be people who will ridicule you, mock you, say things to you. 
if you're at your job, at your workplace, and they're talking about and they're sharing their views and ideologies, and you share yours and your faith and belief in Jesus, uh, you could be shunned. It could happen. Get ready for it. The apostles, they weren't, they weren't afraid of the persecution. In fact, they expected the persecution. Why? Because that's what Jesus said would happen. He said, I'm going to send you out like sheep among wolves. You're going to go out and you're going to proclaim the gospel. And they hated me. Guess what? They're going to hate you. The slave is not greater than his master. So if they, they persecuted me, they're going to what? Persecute you. If we are born again believers and Christians, then there will be people who do not like what we stand for. Right? Life's not always going to be easy. There's going to be difficulties. But Jesus said, I will be with you always. And he made that promise to them. Now, there was a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel. He was a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people. This was also, he was the teacher of Paul. Okay, Paul studied under him. He stood up and he gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. Because they had to have a conference meeting about what they're going to do with them. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you're about to do with these men. For before the days of Thutius rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man... It will fail, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overcome them, and you might even be found opposing God. And so this Pharisee steps in. He gives them some counsel. Now, when we hear his advice, it sounds like very extreme wise counsel, but part of his statement isn't completely true. It's ultimately true, but not, not necessarily true in the here and now. He says, if something is of man, it will fail. Well, there's sometimes there's things that get started in the power of man that last for a very long time. Ultimately, in the end of the end time, it will fail. But you think of you think of Islam. That's started by man, not God. And it's been a, around for a long time. Mormonism started by man, not God. It's been around for a while. Okay? But what he says at the end is for sure true. That when God starts something, it will not fail. When, if God's behind this, he says, there's nothing we're going to be able to do to stop it. And that's exactly true. Why? Because Jesus himself said, I will build my church. He is the head of the church, the leader of the church. He protects the church. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so the church of Jesus will remain until he returns, and it will not fail. Now, there may be times and seasons in certain continents and certain geographical locations where it seems like the church is moving greater than it was once before, but the church the, will always be, it will never fail. There is nothing that's going to stop God's movement. We're part of that. We're a part of this movement called the church who preaches and teaches and lives out this life we call faith in Christ. So they took his advice, and when they had called the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, after they beat them and said, okay, one more time, stop speaking and teaching in his name. Look how they responded. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing. That's different, isn't it? They left the council rejoicing. Why? That they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Who's the name? 
Jesus. They count it as a war wound. It was a scar to tell of faithfulness. It was a mark that they would wear proudly to identify with their Lord. They were committed to this life. They knew the stakes. And when they were warned to stop preaching and teaching in his name, they did it all the more. And they continued in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, watch this. They were in it. They weren't on the fringe. They were told up front by Jesus that when you follow me, expect people to hate you. When you follow me, he didn't give them an altar call and say, well, if you'll just follow me, your life's going to be so sweet and dandy and gumdrops and roses and everything's going to be wonderful and all your life's going to be great and it's going to be wonderful. All your problems are going to work out. No, he let them know up front, if anyone wishes to be my disciple, he must pick up his cross daily and follow me. You must deny self and follow me. And what I'm afraid that has happened in the church is we have people who are on the outside and around Christ, but they're not in Christ. And they love to be around it, but they're not committed to it. It happens this way. Sometimes we do this. My life's going, it's, it's all falling apart. I don't know what to do. I'll tell you what I know what to do. I'll, I'll go to church and... And maybe, you know, my marriage will get saved, my kids will act right, and I'll get a job and all this stuff. And so I come to Jesus, and I, I re- re- repeat the prayer the preacher says to me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, anything, anything to try to make my life better. And then two, three months down the road, things still don't change. You're like, ah, pfft. I knew that Jesus stuff wouldn't work. That's because that's not salvation. That's not conversion. Conversion isn't coming down and saying, Jesus, I want you to make my life better. Save me. That's not salvation. Now, that's what we've preached in America, but that's not salvation. Salvation is when I realize that I am a sinner and I have offended a holy God and I need to be forgiven. And I go to the altar and I say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Save me. Whatever you want me to do is what I'll do. Wherever you want me to go is where I'll go. I will say what you tell me to say. I will walk the path that you lay out for for me. I will live your life. If I need to go through the valley, I'll go through the valley. If I need to go through the fire, I'll go through the fire. I am in it with you. I am in it to serve you. I am in it to glorify you. I am in it to honor you. Some of you have been on sports teams and you've played on teams when there's been people that really aren't there to be on the team. They just want to be on the team. They don't really want to commit to the team, but they like the jersey, they like the cool bag, and they like to say and, and say that they're on part of the team, but they really don't want to commit to the team, right? We've all, we've all seen, seen that happen. I think what happens in the church is we have a lot of people who love to have a Bible. I like to say I go to church. I like to think that I am um, someone who people will let will have the appearance that I'm a believer. But now, Lord Jesus, don't ask me to do anything that I'm uncomfortable with. Don't ask me to really be a witness. I mean, I love being a Christian on Sunday. I put my Jesus shirt on on Sunday. I take my Bible to church with me, or I have it on my phone, I say, and, and, um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll sing a few songs. And, but now don't ask me to live out my faith Monday through Saturday. 
when I'm with my friends and I'm, 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 I'm doing things that I want to do, Jesus, don't interrupt. I don't want, you know, I'll call you when I need you. That's not faith. That's not faith. If you're going to walk in this new way of living, it's surrender. It's obedience. It's saying, Lord, do you, you understand what you say, when you say Lord? I know we don't live in a kingdom, so we don't have lords. But a Lord is someone who rules over you. Right? So when you call Jesus Lord, what are you admitting to? That he is to what? Rule over you. Rule over your mind. Rule over your heart. Rule over your mouth. Rule over everything that you do is to be under submission to him. It's a new way to live. Because before I'm a believer, I live my life to please who? Me. I sat on the throne of my life. I made all the rules. Is everything that Grant wanted to do. But when I become a believer, when I am saved, I have a new Lord over my life. It's no longer me, it's him. And my aim in life is to please him. I would rather be hated by men and loved by God than hated by God and loved by men. This life is very short. It's here for a while and it vanishes. What we do with Jesus will change your eternal destiny. Okay? So I don't want you thinking that you're in when you're not. Have you truly trusted in Jesus as Lord? I'm not asking you if you had an emotional experience or if you just tried out Jesus, no, have you submitted your life to Jesus? This morning, he invites you to a new way to live. And if you have never submitted your life and said, Lord, Jesus, save me. I am a sinful human being. And I have committed violation and sin against you, forgive me, save me, and your life been changed so that now you live different, think different, walk different, talk different. If you've never experienced that new life, then today, guess what? You have an opportunity to do so. And those of us who are believers, we need to pray for boldness. That God would help us to live our faith out in a real, genuine way. Maybe we need to pray for someone that we know is hurt, sick, and in need. I don't know, but we're having an invitation. And that invitation is for you to respond and to do business with the Lord God Almighty. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you.